In this section, you will find many different manipulatives that you can use for my narrative writing lessons. I'm going to go through each one and also give you some suggestions of how you can prepare them so that you can easily use them during your lessons. In this section are many different black line masters that you can duplicate and then prepare them into sets of cards or display different black line masters on large cards so that students can easily access the information. Since there's so many tools in this narrative writing section, I want to show you not only how you can prepare them so that they can be used as manipulatives, but I also need to show you how to store these tools so that you can easily access them during lessons and children can also access these tools when they're writing independently. I organized all my manipulatives in one of these little plastic tubs, which is an organizer for cleaning products that you would find at the grocery store. This has three compartments, two small ones in the front, so that I can store all my tools for my hooks, the story opening, and the setting and character, as well as the problem in the story. So setting character and problem tools belong in these two small pouches. On the reverse side is a large compartment. And in this compartment, I have all the different tools for the actions or the plot in the story, as well as adding describing words. We will walk through all of these different manipulatives and slowly start adding them to this storage tub so you can see how valuable these tools will be for you, as well as how easy you can access them. This is for the first sentence of your story. How are you going to pull that reader into your story so that they get excited and they want to actually read it? Here's a set of tools that I suggest that you show children so that they can come up with many different ways to pull that reader in. Using a narrative hook, the first thing you have to do is decide what emotion is that character having in the story. So you'll notice on this sheet, it says step one, choose an emotion. So if you know right at the beginning of the story, the character is happy, then whatever the hook may be that you choose, the type of hook, you wanna get across that emotion that the character feels happy or silly or scared or guilty, curious, whatever that emotion may be. That's the first step of preparing a hook. The next is down below, you'll see all these different boxes. And this is where the children can choose the type of hook they want to use in order to reveal that emotion. During most of our lessons, we stuck with the top three boxes here. That is using the secret formula, setting character action to pull in the reader, or dialogue or thoughts. Those are the ones that I usually show children until they get very skilled at these three different types of hooks and then I introduce the other six. Setting and character interact with each other. What this is, is that we want the character to do, say, or reveal through their body motions or through their physical motions, how they feel about the setting. How does the setting make them feel? So we have the violent waves grabbed at Mary, her jet black hair tangled and whipped as she struggled to reach the surface. The reason why we chose this hook was not just because Mary was terrified, but the setting was causing that terror. If your setting is critical to what's going on in the story, you may want to start your hook off with that setting and the character interacting with it to reveal how that setting is crucial to the story. The next box is the emotion box. In this box, we want to just say how the character is feeling right at the start of the story. Filled with joy and happiness, Maribel skipped across the playground. So we had our joy and happiness. We just said how she felt. What's her emotion? Joy and happiness. And then we made sure we had a verb, skipped, to match that emotion. The next box is the background box. This is when you're giving background about the character right at the start of the story that will reveal information that you, the reader, need to know. In this case, we had, Stuart had fallen from a tree as a child. He never got over it. Using the stairs or elevator made his body quiver with fear. We know that those sentences 
will reveal something about Stuart, the fact that he's terrified of heights, and most likely he may have to climb something really high for a reason in the story. And now we have this background. We understand his fear and why he's terrified. Another way to start a story are facial expressions. This reveals how the character feels immediately in the story just by the expressions on their face. In our example, Simon's lips quivered, his nostrils flared, and his eyes glared when Felix grabbed the last soda from the icebox. So of course, we know from those facial expressions, his lips quivering, his nose flaring, and his eyes glaring, that he's really angry. Think about how much more interesting the story is when you're just revealing their facial expressions instead of saying, he was angry and mad. We also have body motions. And in this box, we're going to reveal how the character feels through their physical motions. Valerie strummed her fingers on the armrest, rocked back and forth in her chair, then froze when the curtain opened. We know through her body actions, what her body was physically doing, she was revealing how nervous and worried she was, strumming her fingers, rocking back and forth, and then freezing almost with terror as she, the curtain opens. The last hook is a question. How did Stanley know? Did someone tell him? Was this a joke? This question revealed how someone was worried that Stanley knew something, but he did it through questions. When someone's worried about something, many times they'll start asking questions. And in this case, our story begins with those questions and it pulls you in immediately and you have that emotion of the reader being terrified and worried. We have gone through the steps, choose an emotion. How do you want the character to feel right at the start of the story? Then choose one of the different ways that you could write that hook, that beginning sentence or sentences. When you are choosing that hook, you may want to limit it just to the secret formula, SC arrow, dialogue or thoughts, the top three boxes. When the children have those three boxes mastered and you could give them more ideas, then show them the remaining six different ways in order to write a hook. Once they have all nine different types of hooks, you could cut them up into little boxes, put them on cards, and then students could just pick a card so that they could just decide, hmm, I have dialogue. Pick another card. Thoughts. Emotions. They'll just pick a card and they'll use that type of hook to start their story. Or they just look at the different ideas and they choose the one that fits best with what they want to show in the story. I hope you enjoy these narrative hooks. This is a wonderful way for your students to come up with different types of beginnings to their stories to pull that reader in. I have my narrative hooks. Cut them up, put them into a deck of cards. I take the deck of cards and I put them right there so that my story opening, my hook, cards will be in this easy access tub. Let's go to the next set of tools. In your story writing, most of your sentences are going to be do, say, and think. So you'll notice that on the very next page after the narrative hooks, we have our do, say, think cards. These cards are reminders for students that when they're coming up with the different actions and reactions in a story, they can write them as an action, dialogue, or thoughts. I suggest you cut out all three cards, mount them on heavy construction paper, and then adhere a magnet on the back of each card. I put magnets here so that I can easily put this card up on the board when I'm working with students. And when we need to decide how we're going to write a part of the story, I can easily put up the cards, do, say, think. If we decide on dialogue, I put up my dialogue card so we have the template, the line with the comma, the dialogue bubble, and the quotation marks. These three types of sentences, which mostly your stories will be written with, can be easily displayed up on the board so that your students can see the different choices they have as they're writing their stories. In my storage organizer, I'll take the three cards and I'll put them on the back side in the big bucket where the actions of the story go so that I can easily pull those out when I'm planning all the different parts of the story. All of these steps on this card are for you to use when students are having difficulty just sequencing from one action to another.
Let's say our previous action was a little cat climbed up a tree. We then need to go to the next action in the story. So what do we do? We say, what happened next? And then you choose either the word after or while. These are your sequence words. They're critical for students to learn. They help you sequence to the next action. And you choose the one that makes more sense. What happened next? Well, if the cat climbed up the tree, then we would say what happened next after the cat climbed up the tree. Or if we wanted to find out what was happening while the cat climbed up the tree, then we would say what happened next while the cat climbed up the tree. So you need to choose either after or while in your sequence statement. And finally, notice the empty line. You're going to put whatever the previous action was. So the cat was climbing up the tree. We have our sequence statement. What happened next while the cat was climbing up the tree? It's critical students learn how to say this sequence statement because many times students will go from one sentence to another and they jump into the story. They go further in the story and they lose their reader because they left out different actions. This helps them stay on topic and to sequence if they're having difficulty with sequencing. Once they have that sequence statement, then they can go to the next part of this card. What happened next while the cat climbed up the tree? If they can't come up with an idea, then they can choose an emotion card. And the emotion card is going to help them come up with an idea. Because when characters do things in stories, they have an emotion. So if a student is saying, what happened next while the cat climbed the tree? Huh, I can't come up with an idea. Let's make it interesting. Pick an emotion card. And when you pick an emotion card, it helps you come up with an idea. Like for instance, maybe something happened that made the cat angry. So then we would say, what happened next while the cat climbed up the tree? Something made the cat angry. And at that point, we can come up with an idea. So this emotion section here is optional. If students already have an idea, you don't need to think of an emotion to help them get there. So we now have a cat climbing up the tree. What happened next while he climbed up the tree? Ooh, something happened that made our cat angry. So at this point, we're going to come up with our idea. Something made the cat angry because its tail got stuck on a branch. Once we come up with that idea, the cat was angry because his tail got caught in a branch, then we need to decide how will we write that? Will we write that showing he was angry that he did something, said something, or thought something? So we could start our next sentence off with, he snarled and tugged at his tail. There's our do sentence for revealing that he's angry and the next action. Or the cat says something, who's pulling on my tail? Or the cat thinks something. What in the world is going on? What's happening to my tail? These are the three different types of sentences that we can choose from to reveal that the cat is angry in the next action. Once we have the do say think, then we can go to, shall we add any describing words? That's where we're going to decide, should we describe using the five senses, emotions, or personality words. This is also known as ape. That's A for appearance using the five senses. P, personality, E, emotion. Those are words that you would use to describe how the character feels or what kind of character traits does that character have. At this point, we would go back in that sentence and look at, let's say, the cat tugged at his tail and snarled with anger. In that sentence, what could I describe? The character's personality, emotions, or five senses. Which one would be best? Well, it's all about the tail, because we know the tail's being stuck. So we decided that we were going to describe the cat's tail. In that part of the story that they want to describe, they can put an X on the picture that, that they have on their organizer, then they go back and they describe it. And when they describe it, they always describe it using the phrase, what kind of. So our phrase is, what kind of. 
and then you're going to put whatever they're describing in the context of the story. What kind of tail would be stuck in the tree? A long tail, ooh, a curly tail, that makes even more sense. Let's say that. So, the cat pulled on its curly tail and snarled with anger. There we go. We described the tail. We chose to describe what the tail looked like, curly, because now the reader will infer, oh, that curly tail, it can easily get tangled into something. Again, let me reiterate, all of these steps on this card are for you to use when students are having difficulty just sequencing from one action to another. On the very next page, we still have the same exact parts, what happened next, and the emotions to come up with an idea, but what I've added is in addition to how to write a sentence, instead of just do, say, think, you could include in the next sentence just the character's emotion, tell their background, interact with the setting, give their facial expressions, body emotions, or ask a question. These are the same types of cards that we had at the beginning to reveal the hook. It doesn't mean that you can't use these throughout the story. This is more of an advanced way to show kids that these are other types of sentences you could use in your story. I'd be careful about introducing these, and I only would introduce them if they had the do, say, think down. I provided this with just different alternatives for you to use. If we went back to the cat and said, what happened next? While the cat climbed up the tree, ooh, the cat became angry. Maybe my next sentence can just reveal the cat's emotion. Upset and livid, the cat was frustrated because he was stuck. Or background. At this point, maybe I could reveal the background of the cat. This cat was always getting into trouble. Nothing ever worked out for him. Or I could have the setting and character interacting. The tree felt like long, scraggly arms grabbing at the poor little cat and his pathetic tail. Maybe I could have facial expression to reveal this next action in the story. The cat's ears twitched and his eyes glared as he saw his tail caught on a branch. Maybe body motions. His body shook and his claws seemed to grab toward the branch that was reaching at his tail. Finally, we could ask a question. Why is the kitty always getting into trouble? Why is he always having problems? Can anything just happen right for this poor little cat? And the last step is just like the previous page where you would go back and add fancy words. Let's move to the next pages. The emotion cards, these are small cards for you to duplicate, cut out, and to make a small deck of cards for table use. Or you will find the same emotion cards, but they are much larger so that you can use them for whole group or whole class lessons. These emotion cards are chosen when students need help planning the next action in their story. If they can't come up with an idea, then they choose an emotion card. Please duplicate the pages mount them on tag board, cut them out so that they become a deck of cards. These cards have been stored in the large part of the bucket along with the do say think cards. So when you're planning the different parts of the story, choose an emotion card and then use the do say think cards to decide how to write it. These tools are specifically suggested to use when you are writing dialogue or thoughts. Instead of saying, Mary said, and then we have her dialogue, come here, Wilma. We want to add something on that marker, Mary said. And these are four different techniques that you can use for the dialogue or thoughts to add more to reveal how the character is feeling or to reveal their personality. For example, if I wanted to say that Mary was angry, stomping her feet and glaring, Mary shouted, come here, Wilma. So notice I didn't just say Mary shouted, I showed what her body was doing. Here's four techniques that you can use to add to your dialogue or thought in your come alive box to make that character come alive. First one is describe using their physical actions or facial features and then have them say or think something. So in this case we had knees knocking, heart pounding, Sid stuttered, g -g good evening ladies and gentlemen. In the next box, we had how the character felt. And in this case, they were just doing an action. Let's look at what we have. 
Livid, upset, and perplexed, Mike marched into the room demanding answers from the team. So again, instead of saying Mike marched into the room, we can begin with livid, upset, and perplexed. What if we wanted to add dialogue in there? Livid, perplexed, and upset, Mike marched into the room and shouted, I want answers now. So notice you can do this with dialogue or an action. The third box is use five senses to describe what's happening around the character. In this case, the setting can reveal more about how the character feels. Let's look at the example. The crowd roared and waved as Sandy thought, I can't believe we are going to win the finals. Notice if you just wrote Sandy thought, I can't believe we're going to win the finals, mm, that's okay. But when you add what's happening around her, the crowd is roaring and shouting, that adds more to her emotions and the feeling of what's going on in the story, the atmosphere, the mood. So this is a great way to reveal more about how the character feels or the mood of the story by just describing what's happening around them. The last one is just reveal unusual behaviors about the character or their personal history. Let's look at the example. Susie was a city girl. Her world consisted of taxi cabs and skyscrapers. So snakes, frogs, and gators were going to be a problem. What a wonderful way to reveal who she is and also show what's going to happen to her next in the story. And what do we do? We just gave her history. We gave some information about her so that when you know she's around these frogs and snakes, she's going to be terrified because that's not her world that she's usually in. These four cards are wonderful ways for you to add to your come alive box. And basically what you're looking at is you're looking at how am I going to make my character come alive? I could reveal more about the character by showing their facial or body motions. I could put a heart on the stick person, show how they feel, reveal what's happening around the character, or give some sort of past history or show some sort of unusual behavior the character typically has, like twirling their hair, tugging on their lip, those particular behaviors that reveal something about them. What I've done is I've copied these pages, cut them out, and mounted them on tag. This is just another tool that your students can use to help their character come alive. These cards belong in the character and setting compartment of your narrative toolkit. Duplicate them, mount them on the cards, and store them right here so that you can easily access them when you are creating your Come Alive box. This page begins our problem cards, or the conflict that a character will have in the story. We have a chart here, and basically what it is, is it's showing you that when you start a story, first you need to choose the setting, the character, then you can choose a problem. When you choose a setting and character, keep in mind that you want to think about what is the mood or what is the atmosphere of the story and what kind of character trait does your character have. So if I was starting a story off and I had a dog, what kind of dog is it? It's a sweet, cute dog. I have this sweet, cute dog. The setting, I need to create a mood in the setting. So I'm going to think, hmm, what would match with a sweet, cute dog right at the beginning of the story so that I can get that feeling, that emotion of a cute dog and I don't want them to be in anything scary right away. So maybe I'll just have them at the park or running around in the grass and it's really beautiful out. The next step as I start thinking about my story and making my character and setting come alive and creating this wonderful feeling is to then have a problem occur. When a character has a problem in a story, they either are going to face a problem or they have a need or want. Those are your two different categories that you would go into. What I did was I created typical problems or needs or wants in a story 
on the cards on the following pages. Choose one of those cards to help you come up with a story. For instance, maybe on the next page, a child chose break something. So the dog's running through the park and having a great time and he's sweet and lovely and now something happens and it breaks. So maybe he's running around and he jumps up in the air and he lands on a picnic table and breaks somebody's barbecue that they had up on the picnic table. And that starts the problem in the story. Or the next card below that, maybe they chose this one and the dog was running around with another puppy and then the puppy was suddenly lost. Or running around with, with the little boy and the boy lost the puppy or the little boy was lost and the puppy has that as the problem in the story. You choose a problem card to help you come up with just that. What's going to happen in the story? What's the story going to be mostly about? Just like the other cards, duplicate them, cut them out, and mount them on some tag board. Then put them into a deck of cards. Take your deck of cards and place them in your tub in the compartment marked problem or conflict. And notice I have an X there representing that's the problem. These are different types of transitions that are commonly used in narratives. When, where, how, emotions, and sound effects. They can refer to this chart for many different words or phrases that can begin the sentences in their stories. I recommend that you duplicate this page, mount it on tag paper, make sure that you have excess room when you mount the tag paper so that you can fold it on each end so that it will stand up on the table. This way students have this to look at as a little table chart or you can lower the flaps so that it's flat and put it underneath your document viewer so that students can see up on the wall what different choices they have for narrative transitions. Many teachers also make this into a large chart so that it's displayed in the classroom for students to use as well. This transition chart would be stored in the actions part of the story so that when you're planning your action sentences, your dialogue, thoughts, actions, you have these different transitions to choose from to start your sentence off if necessary. These are transitions using mentor text. One of the things that you want children to see is that reading should connect to writing. So whenever you're reading aloud stories, when they're reading their own stories, or when you're focusing on a story, let's say in an anthology or any chosen story that you're focusing on for many days, you may go back and try to capture different transitions that an author has used in their story writing. So in this particular case, on this page, we have when transitions, we have where transitions, and we also have sound effects. These were actual transitions from different stories that we found. This is a wonderful activity, not only because it will provide students with more sophisticated and varied ideas for transitions, but it also makes them more aware of them when they're reading stories in the future. And they'll remember those ideas and be able to connect them to their own writing. You can record these transitions just on blank paper. You can have a chart that you pull up after you finish reading a story. You could give this to students in a book for them to record their own transitions. It's really endless. The whole idea is for them to have this awareness and a resource to go to of other authors and how they transition their sentences. Fancy word cards. On these particular pages, what you will find are the different techniques for your students to add fancy words to their writing. So we have our salt and pepper shaker filled with beads that I suggest that you use as a manipulative in order to have children add fancy words. Six cards that you can cut out. The first five are for the five senses. What something sounds like, feels like, smells like, tastes like, or looks like. In addition to the five senses, you also have a heart. So the heart is for emotion words or personality words. Notice that when I said these six cards deal with five senses, that means appearance, so there's the A. Or the heart, which is emotions or personality. Well, P is personality and E is emotion, so again, Whenever we're describing something, we want to think about aping it. Do we want to describe the appearance, personality, or emotion? 
which will fit when we describe something. And then we go to our five senses cards and decide do we want to use one of our five senses or we show the heart card and say, or would it be better to reveal an emotion or the personality for describing words? Duplicate the six cards, mount them on tag paper, and then I suggest that you store them in the large compartment right next to the actions. I have my fancy words deck of cards that I can put in the tub along with the salt and pepper shaker. This way, after I plan my actions in the story, then I can go back and see if I need to add any fancy words. And all these tools are in one specific area. At the end of all of our stories, we ended them with the secret formula, TCR. You will see a story closing or ending chart that shows that TCR secret formula. T is for transition. C is for character. R is for reflection. You have different transitions for this last sentence, this story closing or ending. And that may be from that day on, looking back in the end, once, since, forever after. You could keep adding more transitions to start your last sentence of the story. These are just starters for you. Please continue adding different ways to begin this last sentence. The character could be a person, an animal, or if you're telling the story from the first person point of view, I. And finally, the R is for reflection. After this story is over, how did you or the character, a person or animal, how did they feel? What did they wish? What did they think, discover? They're reflecting back on what happened. They're basically giving you the message or the meaning or the lesson from this story. And that's where you're going to use one of these key words. The character wished, learned, felt, realized, discovered, understood. And again, keep adding more verbs here as you come up with them. You use this secret formula, TCR, to help them have that story closing. This is a fabulous way for your students to have that last sentence in their story. Many times, this is one of the most difficult sentences for students to write because they don't know what to put there. So sometimes they may write, that's the end of my story, I hope you like it. And we're trying to show them you want to end this by revealing the whole idea of the story, the meaning of the story. And you can do that through a reflection. On the facing page, you'll see a card that you could put in your toolkit or that you could just put up on your poster on your wall. And this card is the question that you would ask. At the end of the story, what did the character or you think, feel, or wish about what just happened? I don't store these cards in my narrative writing toolkit bin. I just made the card up here so that you could put this up on your wall chart. It's really not a manipulative for, your, for you to store in your narrative writing toolkit. It's more of a visual for you to display on the TCR story ending or story closing chart. The last two pages of our narrative writing tool section are lined paper. And these pages are there for you to duplicate and give to your children to write their stories on. Or you can just give them regular notebook paper or line paper that you have at school. I included this for you so that you would have some nice looking paper for your students to write and publish their stories. In addition, for them to draw a picture on the first page of their story. And I have a title line right there also so they can write their title. Here we go. All your narrative tools have been described, put together, and stored in this container so that you can run your lesson smoothly and in a nice pace, and you don't feel like you're always scrambling around trying to find all of these different items. I hope you enjoy narrative writing, and I hope that your students find these tools, make their stories more interesting and sophisticated. Good luck.